Vishnu. Welcome to the RevTech Revolution podcast. It's, it's real to have you here. We've been playing schedule jockeying for a while, so we're really glad to have you. Thanks a lot for inviting me, Betsy. It's great to be here as well. Thanks for making the time. So would love to start out by understanding a little bit more about you. So you've been with Credit Karma for nearly a decade. That's a long stretch in the tech industry. So tell us about Credit Karma, your role there, and what keeps you sticking around? Yeah, so uh, definitely a long stint, and it's been my longest stint in my career. And uh, when I joined Credit Karma, Credit Karma already had 25 million users. This is in 2014, and uh, we were around a couple of hundred people. And the company was already like hitting it on all cylinders in terms of uh, delivering on our mission for our members. And our mission for our members has been something that uh, attracts a lot of people to the company. Interestingly, I won't say at that time, that was the thing that attracted me to Credit Karma, but uh, that is what has really kept me here for such a long time and is pro probably going to keep me here for much longer than that. Uh, the, the company has, uh, as a, uh, uh, I, I was listening to a couple of other podcasts on your, uh, uh, on your channel and uh, I heard about someone talking about international students coming over here and establishing credit and uh, building their uh, uh, financial status within the country. I was an international student. When I came into the country, I applied for like all kinds of random credit cards because they were giving out pizza or t-shirts and got a bunch of declines in the first few yeah. months. And then I said, I'm going to wait it out. And then after that, I applied for something and then I got it. And I was like, I don't know why I got, uh, got declines in the first place. And I don't know why I got an accept at the later place. Um, and that's just like one uh, group of users. I think what Credit Karma has been doing for the 15, 16 years that's been active is uh, help every single American who is of who's an, who's of age, who has a financial uh, uh, score, credit report with the bureaus, an opportunity to just look at where they are in their financial lives and then figure out what they want to do and like figure out where they want to be and how a credit report and credit score is a tool or a set of tools that they can use for themselves and not as a set of tools that gets used against them right i think uh, that was probably like a biggest thing that uh, i realized as i started working in the company i think what attracted me to the company was uh, 25 million users the scale at which it was operating and uh, obviously uh, the founding team and the passion that the founding team has always had towards delivering on the mission uh, but what's kept me here is to uh, because it's allowed me the company has allowed me to be a, a significant part of delivering on the mission and uh, Prior to Credit Karma, a lot of my background was in early stage startups where I'm used to being in the middle of things and moving things on my own and having an opportunity in a company operating at that scale, 25 million users, and still be part of the team which is moving things forward. That's been, I've, I've been, it's, that's just been amazing. That's great. <clears throat> and so for people who don't know the mission of Credit Karma, and I'm just going to paraphrase here, please correct me. Is it is it that concept that you are allowing people to use their credit score proactively for them instead of having other companies use it against them? Is that kind of how the mission boils down or how would you phrase that? The mission of the company is essentially to help every single person improve uh, on their journey to financial progress, whatever that means to them for their phase of life and for their stage and what they care about with respect to their personal finances. That's really the mission. And like I said, these are all like a set of tools. These are a set of tools that uh, the, rest, the way the rest of the world looks at you is by looking at some of the data that is part of your credit report, that is your credit score. And there, there might be like other data points like your income and your employment status and all of that. That's how the rest of the world looks at you, whether to decide whether to give you a place to stay for re a rental or whether to decide to give you a job or whether to decide whether they can give you a line of credit for to buy a home or a car or anything, right? So 
it's it's more about making sure that we are allowing our users getting access to the things that they need so that they can have control over their own financial progress in the best way possible for their own needs and wants. That is much more eloquent than what I said. But uh, tell me, I'm interested in this part about, um, I've heard in some of the podcasts you've been on that you call yourself a co-founder at heart. And clearly part of the reason you're able to stick there is the idea that you can be that at scale, it sounds like, which is terrific. Do you have a good example of um, how that mentality has really changed your approach to leading at Credit Karma? Yeah, I think uh, I would say when you're a co-founder at heart, uh, you care about all aspects of uh, where the company is and what it wants to do for its users and members. And you're not just like specifically caring about the things that your title says that you care about. I think you need to care. I mean, I, I'm, on the, I'm in the engineering function, but uh, if you're a co-founder, like uh, I've been a co-founder. And when I was a co-founder, I've gone out and uh, got tea for, uh, there was like a photo shoot or something that was happening. And then there were people who needed uh to get uh they, they just needed refreshments and there was no one around to do it and i said okay i'm going to go do that so when you do that and and like i've done customer support at 1 a.m i've done customer support at 2 a.m because that's when i felt that i'm going to learn the uh, if someone is like sticking around on an app that i built at 1 a.m well they're trying to do something that they want to do and i can learn from them so you learn from them so i think one aspect of it is to make sure that you are not allowing your title or not allowing your function to divert away, divert you away from doing what's really needed to help the company and help your users. The second part of it is, uh, like I already mentioned, is you can learn from every single person in the company. And uh, you, everyone brings a different set of perspectives and how can you learn from those perspectives and that way then you are going to be able to use that well to again move the company forward, move us, uh, help us do a better job uh, for our users. And then uh, a nice side effect of all of this is that uh, you focused on what's good for you in the longer term, you focused on what's good for the company in the longer term and some of the the shorter term pulls and pushes and pressures, you, you have an opportunity to look beyond that and focus on what's important for everyone in the longer term. That kind of um, holistic approach or, or numerous criteria versus kind of short term results or even what's in your job description, I think is so critical to being a good leader. Um, and, and I think a good designer. Uh, so I was interested to hear that you led the charge on the development of Credit Karma's recommendation systems. Um, would love to hear some stories about that in particular, you know, at the end of the day, how much has been pure data and AI and where does the human factor fit in? Yeah, I think uh, uh, we have gone through multiple iterations of uh, our uh, recommender system internally. When I joined the company, the company uh, already knew that the user's data was very, very valuable in helping identify the right set of financial products that you want to put in front of the user. So there was already uh, some semblance of uh, recommendations happening, uh, but they were happening in like in different pockets in different ways. I think the first step for us when I came in was to make sure that we were able to centralize all of that into like one single recommender system that could then uh, allow everybody in the company to use that system to drive all recommendations across various uh, pages or sections of the app. Now, when you do that, uh, just in the first phase, and talking about like year one, just in the first phase, now there, there, are, there, are, there were teams and there were individuals who had already invested in doing the best possible job that they can do in their own section to make the best possible recommendations that they can think of. So if you do not try to sit with them and understand what they were trying to achieve and what were they trying to do well for the company and for the members, you are not going to be able to incorporate the best parts of what they were trying to do 
into the centralized uh, recommender system. So it's really important to understand uh, what were they trying to do? What were their intentions? Forget the implementation. I mean, you, if you just focus on the implementation, you're probably going to say, hey, they don't know what they are doing. But if you focus on what they were trying to do, what they were intending to achieve, then you have an opportunity to make the centralized recommender system stronger. And just the act of sitting with them and understanding what they were trying to achieve, it also allows you to build a partnership with them. In that case, what is going to happen is they're not going to look at you as the person who is taking their uh, reducing the impact that they had. They're going to look at, at you, look at you as a partner and they're going to come back when they have ideas. They're going to come back with ideas and then come and talk to you and make your system better. So make and make it our make our system better, right? Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the the journey of creating this recommendation system. So even from the very beginning, looking at the data sets that you had and the the relative cleanliness of them, and how much of a challenge was that for Credit Karma? Did you have your house in order in that regard? Yeah, one of uh, our uh, biggest, uh, I think, very very early decisions that the company had did, and like kind of like the bedrock of the company's uh, foundation was tight integration with the credit bureaus. So what that means is a lot of the important data that our members need us to have so that we are able to use that to deliver accurate and relevant financial product recommendations to them is based on credit bureau data. And credit bureau data, the credit bureaus have invested decades of effort into making sure that they are collecting clean data, they are investing in data quality, they are investing in making sure that the uh, the quality the quality of the data is of high standards. So uh, to be able to operate on top of that uh, allowed us to spend a lot of time in the first few years that I was here in making the right investments in the right systems as far as machine learning is concerned, and also invest quite a bit of time in uh, investing in our data pipelines for uh, collecting behavioral data. Because when you have the credit report data, you really only understand uh, one part of the equation. And that one part of the equation is if Vishnu were to apply for a particular financial product from a particular bank, what are the chances that Vishnu is going to get approved for that particular product by that bank? That's all we know. Uh, but by investing in the data pipelines to collect the behavioral data, we also get a sense of what does Vishnu really want? What does he want to achieve? Does he want to go get a new car? Does he want to go save for a home in California? Or does he just want to uh, make sure that he's managing his debt appropriately? So to be able to uh, get that information about what our users want and need, uh, we needed to make that investment in our uh, uh, tracking data, or what we call as like tracking data collection pipelines. And uh, make that easier and easier so that when new teams, new in, the company kept growing, right? So we, when I joined, we were 200. Now we are like 16, 1700. So as the company keeps growing, there are new engineering teams coming in and they're building new experiences for our users. When they build new experience for our users, that's an opportunity to understand the user a little bit better. And we wanted to make sure that we uh, did that in a way where when new teams get added, they have an easy way of... Uh, also making sure that they're collecting the data properly for us. Uh, but there's a lot I can talk about some of the other earlier systems that we invested in as well, which, uh, which continue to do a great job for the company and which I'm very, very proud of the teams that ended up doing that. Yeah, I would love to hear um, kind of one of, your, one of your best stories that you've got in regard to an early system that laid this foundation to take you from 600 to 1,600 or whatever your number of employees are now? Yeah, so uh, 200 to 1,600. And uh, uh, one of the earliest ones that we invested in was a, a, a model uh, scoring system at scale. And uh, these are all, there are a lot of different open source implementations. There are cloud implementations available at this point of time in the industry today. So someone starting out new would just end up going and using something from one of the big cloud vendors or just like adopt something open source. But when we started, we didn't have that. And we knew that uh, we had an amazing data science team, which was uh, which were like already building models that we knew could be very powerful if we were able to help use that for our members appropriately. And we knew that that is a big blocker. 
So to enable our data science team to deliver the impact, we needed a system uh, which internally we call as prophecy. Uh, essentially, it serves predictions. It takes in all the models that our data scientists have built, and it takes in the user's data. And when users come to the app, it scores thousands of models for every single user, every single session. And that helps drive our recommendation systems. And this is an investment that we made very, very early on because we knew that that was a big gap because we were basically crippling our data science teams in terms of how uh, how we were operating. So, and then once we made this investment, once, once we deployed that sometime in 2015, 2016, it really unlocked the potential of our data scientists to have an impact in our members' lives as well as our business. And... Uh, the system, we've continued to iterate on it. We've continued to make it better and it still operates. We do like more than 50 billion predictions a day for our users. And uh, to be able to make that investment at the right time and then uh, build, make sure that we had the right, time, right team to be able to keep that going along the way uh, over like seven, six, seven, eight years and continuing to operate at such large scale is just like something of very, very, uh, I'm going to just hold it in my head for a long time. Is there a hypothesis early on that you had that e either new behavior data, um, yeah, let's just say new behavior data nullified um, that was a surprise to you and your team or or any kind of aha moment that you had when you added new data sources? Uh, again, this goes back to like very, very early days where uh, uh, when you're a fintech, when you're in the business of uh, helping members uh, find the right credit cards and personal loans, uh, it's very easy to look at our members in the way big banks look at them because they are our partners. They are giving us information. They are giving us advice and they are giving us guidance where uh, when big banks are designing their products, whether it's credit cards or whether it's personal loans, they are designing, this is for the prime user, this is for the subprime user, this is for a user between this credit score and this credit score. And I think naturally some of the experiences that we built mimicked how these products were getting designed for what segments of users. Uh, and then once you started uh, collecting a lot of the behavioral data, and then when you combine the behavioral data with the, with the credit data, then you have an opportunity to know that uh, someone might have uh, like a, uh, not a great credit score at this point of time, but they are on the journey uh, to aspire for things that you didn't, you would normally ask them, you normally not put in front of them, right? I mean, like, uh, maybe I'll just take a personal example, right? When I came into the country the second time around in 2013, I had a really good credit score because I was in the country like 10, 12 years back and I had, uh, I had like a few credit cards that were open for a long time and I didn't have balances. So I had like no credit report. So, but at the same time, I had a good credit score and I had a good income. I had a good job with a good income. Now, if someone was just, if a particular product was just designed for someone with like a, a deep credit history, I won't get approved for that particular product. But as soon as I came into the country, I had a family and which means that I had higher aspirations. So it's not just today's credit score and credit uh, report that matters. It's also the trajectory of the user in terms of what they're aspiring towards, what they're going to get to. Uh, to be able to uh, ha use all of the data, like I, if I'm interested in like prime cards because I'm, I think of myself as a prime, mem prime member, uh, uh, while the banks might not, see that in the data currently. So then there's an opportunity for Credit Karma to help me find the path to get to those goals. Um, and then Credit Karma is also telling me like, Vishnu, if you apply for these products, you're not going to get approved for it. So just the signal back to me that I'm not going to get approved for these products, then I just like, I'll just back off, right? I'm not going to do the same thing that I did when I came here as a student, where I'm just going to like nonstop keep applying for products. So. To be able to bring the financial data that banks look at, as well as the behavioral data that we collect, and then allow that to tell the user, we know you're interested in these products, we're going to show them to you, but don't apply for them now, wait for a little bit, 
improve your uh, uh, credit health and then you're going to uh, you're going to get approved for it so just that opportunity to do that is uh, is probably something that i would see, uh, i would say is like how we transition from a credit score credit range based experience to an experience that is actually more tailored for every single user's personal situation uh, and then using all the great machine learning uh, techniques and the data to be able to get there I think that time was a big aha moment. That is a great illustration, I think, of something that feels pretty unique about Credit Karma because your business is very um, data tech and intellect intensive, right? But at the end of the day, your customers are people and they come to you for help with financial matters that can be really emotional. So um, are there any other uh, examples of how Credit Karma takes that human factor in when designing products or when seeing opportunities in the marketplace that other people might not see because you have such rich data and such an interesting way to look at it. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that we have invested in the last few years is uh, incorporating machine learning into our notifications. Uh, we send out millions of notifications to our members and I remember when I joined the company, I would look at the number of notifications that Credit Karma would send me. And then I would look at the number of notifications that I used to get from a bunch of other companies. And I would see like, I would say like, I don't get a lot of emails from Credit Karma. What's going on? Is there like something that capability that we are missing? What do we do? Uh, then I figured out that uh, we had a very, we had an artificial but necessary constraint to make sure that we are only sending relevant notifications, emails or push notifications to our members and the artificial constraints where you can only send X emails in a month, Y emails in a week. So we used to have, we had those constraints. Now, uh, the constraints were great to make sure that we were able to uh, make sure that we are doing the right thing for the user where we are not spamming them uh, just to make sure that we are building on like some uh, uh, fancy engagement metrics like MAUs and DAUs for just for the metrics sake rather than what was beneficial for the members. But at the same time, uh, there were a lot of situations where I would much rather hear from Credit Karma, especially when it comes to my uh, financial health. Uh, I'll give you an example. My uh, I'm actually flying to India tomorrow and my flight, uh, flight was like supposed to be like Tuesday night. And then uh, a couple of days back, my wife had booked the ticket. A couple of days back, my wife gets an email from the, uh, from the agency from saying that, like, hey, your schedule has changed. And she said, okay, normally I get these emails when the schedule changes from 8 a.m. to 8.15 a.m. or 8.15 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. We look at it, like, on the day of travel. And then we just checked again. And then when we checked again yesterday, it sounds like the flight was canceled. <laughs> I'm, tra I'm traveling to India and my flight was canceled and I didn't get a push notification or I didn't get an email warning me your flight is canceled. You need to go change your flight. Now, that's a, that, I mean, if I'm in that situation, I need to be told immediately so that I can make alternate plans. Now, with respect to financial health, if you're able to translate that to financial health, right, if someone has stolen your identity and if you are... Uh, they're like uh, uh, trying to apply for a personal loan or a credit card uh, using your identity. You want to know immediately. You don't want to wait uh, two days because Credit Karma has this artificial constraint that I will only send you one email every week. You need. You want to know immediately about yeah, right. that. So Absolutely. I think to be able to make sure that we understand the situation and the context well for the user, for the things that are happening and then help them know that like this is important, take care of it right now. Or if something can wait, uh, get the system to wait and then let the user know about it. So I think to be able to do that, we needed to incorporate machine learning. And uh, we've had a lot of success in that where our machine learning is able to drive value for our business. It's able to drive value for our members while maintaining the longer term health of the platform in a suitable way. Interesting. So tell me about the application of machine learning when it comes to overcoming kind of those uh, what I'll term as kind of more brittle business rules that you had about um, uh, artificial caps on email. So how did you use machine learning to overcome that? What were some of the steps? I think a lot of this comes to 
understanding which of these rules are really hurting our members and business and making sure that we are having a conversation with uh, the people who, again, going back to my earlier comment, the people who put these constraints in place, they put these constraints in place for a reason. Now, what are the reasons that are the intent that they had before putting these constraints in place? First, understand the intent and then understand if you're going to take that rule away, what's going to happen? Like what what will happen? Just try to get an understanding. Maybe you run an A-B test to understand you take a constraint away, what's going to happen? And then when you see that, uh, because at our scale, we're going to get these learnings very, very quickly. Then you know that what's the worst that can happen? Uh, if you take that constraint away, what's the best that can happen when you take that constraint away? And then you're able to fine tune your approach and understand like how you can uh, use machine learning. And to, to use machine learning, we need to collect some amount of data. So one is the A-B test to understand if you take the constraint away, what's going to happen. And second is how, what kind of model model or what kind of modeling technique are you going to bring in place to be able to make that machine learning driven? And do you still need some kind of a soft rule because models can take some time uh, to get better? How do you keep your models operating as well as needed to meet the intent of the original constraint? And then while afterwards, you can like uh, start, basically you think of it as like a stepwise uh, softening of the constraint. You soften the constraint you, uh, and then you uh, put your model in you collect the data, you build the model, you put that model in, and then you go to then have an opportunity to understand with a softer constraint, with the model, how things are working. Then the next phase is you have an opportunity to take even that softer constraint away because you know that the model is doing what you want it to do. Uh, and, so, and sometimes you're going to uh, not get the objective properly the, of the initial constraint. So that's the reason you go through like a couple of phases here and especially with something like this, which is like very, very important, impactful for the company, we would much rather take a, like a couple of phases in before we are able to get to a good place. So I'd love to know a little bit more about your teams when you're designing a new data heavy product and how you balance data intellect and, and human factors and emotion. Um, it sounds like you are very well calibrated in both senses, but do you have folks from design teams, marketing teams, like what is the org structure as you're getting into a bit of an R&D on a new product development? Uh, there are things which are primarily user facing uh, and there are things that are happening in the background. Uh, some of the notification stuff that I talked about is happening in the background. And in that situation, we are partnering very, very heavily with our marketing teams to make sure that we understand what they are trying to achieve. Uh, but if when we are working on something that is user facing, like as soon as you open the app, the, uh, the home page where you land on, design is very, very, very heavily involved in how we go about thinking about it. And uh, I think it's important to understand that uh, the intersection of like, uh, HCI and AI is like still super nascent at this stage. And it's important to understand that you, uh, like I come from more from the AI and data side and like I don't, I, by design, I don't really understand everything that the design team is thinking about. So it's important to just like go in there with an open mind and understand what are they thinking about? Uh, how, are, uh, like for example, if I make everything uh, machine learning driven, then nothing is going to stay in the same place. So, but as a user, I mean, when we just started this call, I think we were told, okay, at right top is where you're going to see recording. Now, uh, if this were, if this whole navigation system was like machine learning driven, like sometimes the leave will be, leave the call would be in the right bottom and sometimes it'd be middle of the screen. Is that a good machine learning use case? Probably not because uh, you just want to understand the navigation. And these are all sensibilities that the design team brings to the table and they understand what's really important and what can be made in a machine learning driven way. And I, I, I also have this like deep, uh, 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 like I keep following some of the research that is happening in, in the intersection of HCA and AI. And like one of the things is that how do you design products which is aware of AI uh, being used to drive that product? 
because once you use AI to put something in front of the user, let's say you put a feed in front of the user, the act of the user going through that uh, feed and experiencing and clicking and scrolling and all of that, that actually is behavioral data that you're collecting, which is going to become used for the next set of models that you're collecting. So I think how do you make sure that your uh, the designer understands how each user's experience is going to evolve and help them understand that help them understand that like hey we want to try to find the most relevant uh, most revenue generating most value generating thing how whatever your objective is and put it right on top uh, and uh, but the designer might say sure you want to put it right on top but do you understand that the users are the way we have designed the product, they're going to click on the middle of the screen rather than at the top of the screen, right? So if you do not, if you uh, don't uh, sit down with the design team and understand how they are thinking about the users, what they are learning from qualitative research, you're going to design the product wrong. But I think it's still a very evolving design. There are a lot of uh, practices, best practices that are coming out from some of the large companies which, who have been doing it for maybe half a decade or a decade. It's important to just like understand uh, how you can Take that, learn from that, and bring it to your own, uh, your own company and your own situation. How does Credit Karma think about data trust when it comes to both your employees trusting the data that they're building on, but then also the um, customers that you have? And what do you do to monitor it and, and check it over time? I think uh, this, is a, this is always a hard problem. Um, especially when it comes to financial data. And uh, if you're putting financial data in front of the user on the basis of which they are going to make uh, some uh, decisions, that uh, uh, then it's really important to get it right. So the way, uh, like I mentioned, we have one of our biggest advantages or benefits is to be working with bureaus. Uh, so, which means that there's a lot of data that comes with like a, a lot of rigor that the bureaus have put in that we are able to bring it to play when we put it in front of our users. At the same time, there are things that we do where there are transformations of the data, there is processing of data that we do internally. Uh, and I think the bigger, the biggest aspect of it is like, how can you make sure that you are tracking all these transformations? And as soon as the transformation changes, you also know why the transformation is changing of data is changing and figure out like how to also centralize a lot of these transformations in one place. Because if you're able to centralize a lot of these data transformations in one place, then you're able to keep adding new tools and technologies that are coming out in the market, whether from, we work very closely with Google Cloud, but we also starting to look at other third party vendors like Monte Carlo who can then come and help us in monitoring some of the data quality. If you're able to get a lot of these transformations in like a few different places, uh, for example, we really care a lot about security of uh, PII, which means that we keep the PII data completely away from all the other data that some of my teams like recommendation systems, data scientists and machine learning deal with. So if you're doing transformations uh, with the secure data, then that's like completely in a separate place. If you're doing transformations of uh, non-PII data, then you're gonna do that in a different place. But if you're able to localize a lot of these translations in a few places, then you can bring some of these tools into play like uh, uh, so that you're able to automatically get some monitoring of the data. You're able to build some rules uh, or you're able to use some out-of-the-box anomaly detection pieces that these tools come with. So you're monitoring the data. Then once you're monitoring the data, then the next part of it is like having the right processes. If a particular data attribute is breaking, what are you going to do? Who's going to look at it? Who's going to fix it? Which team is responsible to fix it, fixing it? And then the triage of data quality issues and how do you quickly resolve it? Do you think of them, as, are these like site incidents? Are these data incidents? We've gone through a lot of those stages. Initially, we used to have two separate uh, incidents track. We used to have data incidents and we used to have site incidents. Then over a period of time, we merged it back in and said like, hey, we need visibility from everyone. You can't really separate out data incidents from site incidents. So we merged all of them back in and said like, we want really site incidents to happen. And then we want the right teams to get involved and fix it with the right level of urgency so that you're able to, and things break. And when things break, I think it's how, how quickly you can react and how quickly you can bring it back to its uh, uh, original operating uh, rhythm 
is really important and that's also an important part of trust one is like preventing big breaks from happening and second is when some of these breaks happen how do you react to it? how do you get better how do you learn from it and how do you get better with that i think we touched upon a couple of these pieces i think the human factor how do you uh look at the human factor when like when you talk about the human factor it's some multiple aspects of it right i think one aspect of it in a company like ours is how are you working with the right partner teams to be able to uh do the right thing for the company on an ongoing basis rather than like you know we're not after like one one shot wins we want to be able to have like sustainable wins with the teams involved then the second aspect of it is like uh you go to use data you want to use ai to do something uh for the user now uh if i show uh the number two product in number one's place and number one product in number two place in the order in which users see it that's not of a big impact the user gets to see what they are going to get uh, approved for and they're going to see it in a wrong order so the cost of a mistake in this kind of a situation is not very high but there are a lot of other situations where the cost of a mistake is very high and as someone who is employing ai we all know ai makes mistakes when ai makes mistakes what's the backstop what's the cost of that mistake what are you building in in your systems to be able to keep working on reducing those mistakes and sometimes the the way you catch and uh, resolve those mistakes or not prevent them from not happening might not be the most elegant situ- uh, solutions but you still need to do it so that you are able to allow your members to trust the product that they are using your members don't really care whether you're using ai or rules or whatever behind the scenes what they really care about is like are you sh- showing him them the right thing are you telling them the giving them the right information at the right time ai is something that we use behind the scenes to be able to do a great job on a personalized basis but you can't make mistakes that is going to hurt our members you need to make sure that you have other mechanisms that you're investing in those mechanisms and some of those mechanisms if you we might we are still figuring out like what those mechanisms are where do you need those mechanisms but you still need those mechanisms in place you still need those audits and checks in place so that you are protecting your members and users from impact that you don't want to have that impact on them you want to protect them from that impact you're trying to help them you're not trying to distract them or you're not trying to hurt them so it's really important to make sure that we are thinking about the investments that you need to make so that when ai makes mistakes you're able to catch it and prevent that from going forward so i'd like to dig in on both of those uh with some follow on questions the first would be and it sounds like you're very sensitive to this based on your own experience um but the date you're only as good as the data set that you get right so there's um implicit historical biases in data sets and so curious to know because you guys uh, appear to strive for um looking more holistically at the data how have you thought about that and what are the things that you've done to try and make sure that it's the products are fair um and not just reliant on historical data which can have its skews yeah i think uh, we've probably looked at it less from a, a data perspective because i think as a as an organization as a company one of the things that we do is make available financial products choice of financial products to our members and uh, finally the banks and the fintechs are the companies which are underwriting these financial products so one of the things that we focus on as a business is like how do we get access to a variety of different financial partners on our platform to our members and uh, and then the second part of it is like how do we keep working with the financial partners to help them in whatever ways we can so that they are able to design products that are needed for uh, the people who are eligible to get it and who can uh, like i talked about right like when i came to the country i was i thought of myself as a prime user but i was from the data's perspective i was not a prime user right. so now are those situations where we need to uh, help some other fintechs come on top of our platform and give access to a lot of other financial uh, products to our members i think we look at it more as an opportunity to 
provide uh, access to our platform to financial partners who want to provide these financial products to our uh, members who need them. I think that's really what we end up spending more time on. And uh, in terms of other things, whether there is like some bias that comes from the behavioral data that we collect, whether there is some bias that we introduce, we are very careful about making sure that the way our business model is structured is we don't we get paid only when the user gets the product. If they do not get the product, we're not getting paid, whether it's credit yeah. cards or personal loans. So that That's way, the, yeah, yeah. So the constraints of the business model naturally forces us to do the right thing for our members. Um, so your job is really breadth of opportunity, as assembling a breadth of opportunity, and then playing back the kind of white space to the banks to say there aren't opportunities here and there's a large audience type of thing. Yeah, that's great. That's an interesting market maker there. Um, the other question I was going to have is about transparency. It's probably a more internal question, but um, in terms of the model building with AI, what are the, some of the steps that you take or you recommend taking in regard to making sure that the model has enough transparency so it can be audited and people can see what's inside the black box and and make sure that um, you guys are doing the right thing. Yeah, I think it starts out with like laying out the objectives. Uh, what are you trying to get the model to do? Uh, making sure that the objectives of what the model is intending to do is uh, put right out in front for anybody to look at. And then second aspect of that is like, how are you measuring success? What does success look like? What are the KPIs and metrics that you need to focus on to make sure that it's in a good place? Whether it's accuracy or whether it is uh, just uh, getting like revenue or whether it is like reducing opt-outs. So just try to make sure that you identify the right metrics. And then uh, the third part of it is pretty much everything that we do within Credit Karma, especially if it's member impacting is through experiments. Uh, so when you have we one of the biggest investments that we made, I would have talked about it if you wanted me to talk about two was the experimentation system. And we again did that in 2016. And the experimentation system allows our data scientists, allow our product engineers, every single team within the company to test out everything. So to ex set up everything as an experiment. And then when you set up everything as an experiment, then you're getting results from the experiment and then uh, and then you can always go back and audit how those experiments were set up and what those results were and what were the reasons why something was not ramped or what were the reasons why something was not ra ramped so then you get a lot of transparency and uh, it's just very convenient for anyone to set up an experiment anyone to view the results of an experiment so then you're making it easy for it's just like transparency is just built into the whole process then yeah, tell me more about the experimentation process that you put in place. And, and it sounds like it's benefiting more than just the engineering teams. Yes, uh, definitely. Right. I think uh, we set up our experimentation system in a way where uh, uh, we knew that a lot of teams wanted to run experiments. We knew that a lot of teams wanted to look at analysis wanted to get an understanding like, okay, the engineering team and the product team decided to ramp this, but I want to know why, because it is taking away something that I used to use and now something else is coming in place. How does that happen? And uh, to be able to do that, you need to make sure that we invested a lot of effort. We still have a team which does a great job in making sure that the front end or the, the it's an internal tool that we built out on top of our experimentation system. And uh, they are able to go and look at the results. And then a lot of those results are also getting published on Slack. People can easily sa share a link to a Looker dashboard, which displays the results of an experiment. So we made these integrations with Looker. We made these integrations with Slack. We made we put together, especially for a data science perspective, we put together a process where every week, week, every week there's a group of people coming together, looking at current status of all these experiments and understanding yeah. what we're going to do next. And we also uh, made the investment in building a team uh, of analysts who are focused just on experiments and how these experiments are set up, how are they designed, how are we evaluating them, how are we do we need a, a longer term holdout uh, to make sure that the results are just like not like a one time newness effect kind of a thing. Uh, so there's a team which is just focused on 
analysis of experiments especially with things like on the modeling side uh so i think there is like process investments there is tooling investments there is like uh, team investments that we had to make to all this work interesting and, and just to give us a sense of the kind of scale how many experiments might you be running at any one time way too many so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i would say that i think uh, i don't really have the number in front of me but at any point of time there are like hundreds to thousands it's a very very rough range but uh, there's just like lot of experiments going on and uh, maybe one way to think about it is uh, probably half the company uses the front end that we have built out <laughs> that speaks a lot about your culture um we've been taking up a ton of your time so i'll just ask one more question vishnu what is making you the most excited about what you guys might be able to accomplish in the next couple of years yeah one of the things that we've always uh, talked about our ceo has always talked about is uh, automation uh, uh to help our members uh do things that uh, that will help them make uh, progress in, in their financial self and uh, figuring out like how we can employ more automation and uh, some of these things are like for example i can i i would i, I know i'm probably overpaying for my auto insurance at this point in time so is there some automation that the company can invest in can build in which will allow me to just uh, tell credit karma hey find my my auto insurance just gets auto renewed right now so it's automated in the favor of the auto insurance company it's not automated in favor of me how can credit karma help uh, bring some of this automation into the app so that it's automated in favor of the member i think that's uh, definitely one of the things that we are very interested in making some early steps and early start uh, using all our data on to help our members better so that's probably something that we are really interested in doing that is very exciting and sign me up <laughs> bishnu thanks again for being a part of the revtech revolution it was really nice having you on i'm glad we finally got a chance to connect and i appreciate your time very much thank you thanks a lot betsy i had a great time as well